Hi, I'm Chris James, I'm the MD of Steel Media for my sins. Um, yeah, in terms of the trends this year, I think certainly, uh, obviously Activision buying King's big news, and I think consolidation generally has been a big trend, I think it's been more of that. Um, I think the fact that Super Soul and King are still, and Machine Zone and maybe a bit of Kabam are still at the top of the charts, that's a trend which is very interesting, if it's ever going to end, I don't know. BR is interesting, but it's too early to be a trend, kind of interesting, no notes can happen. Esports, quite interesting, some stuff going on there, Mobile Guys doing that, Clash, trying to be an esport, um, obviously Vainglory making a bit of headways into that. Um, yeah, and then I think the big thing for me is really the new market, so like China's obviously become number one, but then you've got this whole thing where China, Korea and Japan occupy three of the top five slots, that's huge if you think about it. Like the, and then the Southeast Asia is coming up incredibly fast, so like the real trend is the movement from you know, east to west, moving to east. So east is really the driving force for mobile games at the moment. I think that's it. Hi, I'm Mark Brown, the editor of Pocket Gamer. And I guess the biggest thing that happened in mobile games industry this year was possibly the uh, Activision's buyout of King, the makers of Candy Crush Saga and games like that. Activision, of course, being the massively hardcore company that makes games like Call of Duty and uh, also owns Blizzard, making World of Warcraft and everything, these huge AAA console games, and now uh, buying one of the biggest companies in mobile. It's a, it's a huge, impactful decision that will uh, shows you know who's important now, who are the big players, and King is definitely one of them. Uh, yeah. So my name's Alicia, I'm the editor of AppSpy, and I think the most significant piece of news we've seen in mobile this year is that Activision bought King for 5.9 billion, which is not exactly pocket change. And I think it really shows, for me, kind of, I guess the power of this female demographic, this audience, because that's what Activision didn't have. Traditionally, a lot of their titles are very male-dominated, but I think 60% of King's income comes from female players. So it just shows the power of female gamers and how much that big companies kind of want a bite and a piece of that market. My name is James Gilmore. I'm the video editor for AppSpy and Steel Media in general. The most exciting story to come out of this year is probably the Nintendo NX, if that is indeed what it's going to be called. The idea of unifying the console market and the mobile gaming scene together into one single kind of unit, that's the most interesting thing. Everything points to the unification of these two markets. The idea that you can play a game on your mobile phone, then come home, throw it to your television, carry on playing what you're playing. You'll be able to complete stuff while you're out and about, continue the adventure when you step home and get back online. That is where everything is clearly pointing. That's where the compass is directing everybody. If they can actually make that work, that's going to be an incredible thing. If not, then it will be a kind of a worthy step in the right direction, in the same way that OnLive is, was the right idea, but about 10 years too early. I think if the NX can pull it off, that's a fantastic concept. Everything needs to be played everywhere at all times. Okay, I'm Matt Suckley, staff writer at PokeGamer.biz and my most important, most significant moment of the year was um, Fallout Shelter and even though I didn't necessarily like the game myself, I thought it was important in, in proving that anti-free-to-play sentiment can be used to sell a free-to-play game if marketed correctly. I'm Glenn Fox, editor at One Point Apps, and for me the biggest thing that happened in 2015 was there was a greater focus on free-to-play as last year. Um, it's sort of become more sophisticated, the people, developers have know what they're doing now. Um, there's been a greater focus on upgrade systems and just, like, I think, it's, I think hard currency has become less of a focus and it's more on soft currency and ads and, I, yeah, I, I've, I've been enjoying free-to-play a lot more this year.
I'm Harry Slater, I am the reviews editor of pocketgamer.co.uk and my event of the year has been Nintendo moving into mobile. I think it's a, it's a really interesting move from one of, well, basically one of the biggest um, sort of standard uh, normal gaming publishers almost. And Stephen joining up with, uh, with DNA, it, it's, I think a lot of people are worried about what's going to come out of it, but if you're going to go with anyone to get into mobile and actually make money out of it, then DNA is probably one of the best choices you can go for. Uh, we've seen sort of the first announcements so far with um, with the sort of slightly weird Meverse chat thing um, that I've forgotten the name of, but um, I think that's uh, as a move that's really interesting because one of the things you wouldn't want to do as Nintendo would be release your first game. Uh, like, I don't know, a Mario Auto Runner and have it um, not work with the network that you've built up. So having this Miiverse chat thing first to test out that sort of infrastructure is, is a really smart move. And I think moving forwards, Nintendo kind of has to branch out in this way because Nintendo's always been a very closed closed off system. It's been, it's very difficult to develop indie games for it. It's very difficult to do to sort of create games for Nintendo and Nintendo has always only ever created stuff in, in sort of in, in that sense for its own console. So to see to see even Nintendo admitting that actually mobile kind of is the way forward. Um, and we've seen, you know, various other publishers like Konami and um, and um, another one that I've forgotten the name of again. Um, and I think it, it kind of proves that mobile's where where the, not just where the money is, but kind of where the innovation is as well. And I'm really excited to see what Nintendo come out with uh, in, in next year. I'm Rob Hearn. I'm managing editor for Steel Media. Uh, I think the most interesting thing uh, that I came across this year was uh, I've just come back from G-Star in Korea. Uh, which is fascinating, just to get a glimpse at uh, a different market. Uh, the big contrasts uh, for, between there and the West were uh, VR. There's a lot of difference there, actually. A lot of times when you speak to people uh, in the West, developers from the West, they're, they're very kind of gung-ho about VR. People are investing a lot in VR. They're taking on people to, to, to make games for VR. In Korea, it wasn't really like that at all. They, they sort of... I mean, I don't know whether they're wiser or they're just a, a couple of years behind, but um, there was definitely less interest in VR. Uh, I met a, a kind of a few developers who were making really interesting things, and there was a, a sense of exasperation about how difficult it was in, in their market compared to uh, markets in the West, where people are very, very excited about it. Uh, just generally, I thought G-Star was, was a great show. It was really different to see a completely different environment. It was interesting to see uh, developers in the East making games that, that for a Western market and sometimes not quite getting it. So there was a, there was a, there was a, sometimes there was a kind of a, a tin-eared attempt to create um, things that they thought would appeal to people in the West, like uh, mafia-related games and stuff, which just weren't quite right. But then at the same time, there was, a, there was an indie booth at G-Star uh, called the Big Showcase, which, was, uh, which contained games made by Korean developers, uh, predominantly, not entirely, but predominantly, uh, and what I found there, which was very interesting, is that there is, there was very much a consistency, uh, from a consistentness uh, between the games that were there and the games that you would see at an indie game stand at a Western show. There was just this, you know, indie games have this kind of like artsy sensibility quite often, they're quite experimental. And actually, they were you, the games that I saw at the, the indie game showcase at G-Star were exactly the same kind of games that I would expect to see at uh, a Western show like E3 or Gamescom. So it was interesting to see that there was this kind of universality of, uh, of almost kind of artistic vision in terms of game making for mobile or, or, or otherwise, um, com contrasting with this kind of business-like uh, approach to making games you know, for Western audiences, which didn't, in some cases didn't quite get what would appeal. So yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, G-Star was a fascinating show and Korea is a lovely country.